Um, thank you, uh, uh, everyone. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to join you all uh, today on the Creation World Pneumonia Day and uh, grateful thanks um, um, to the organizers uh, for extending this invitation to me. Uh, and um, in my talk today, um, um, I wish to share some uh, new insights um, on the role of reducing household air pollution exposures uh, resulting from the use of solid cook fuels in reducing the global pneumonia burden for children. Uh, as you can see, uh, the pictures on the left um, provide a very, uh, you know, um, uh, grim reality, grim everyday reality of millions of children, uh, young children uh, being at risk of exposures from the use of uh, dirty solid uh, cook fuels. If I can have the next slide. Globally, the proportion of population relying on solid cook fuel use has declined, uh, but the absolute number of people reliant on this very uh, dirty source of energy uh, for their everyday energy needs and at risk from household air pollution exposures is still a staggering number of over 3 billion people, and mostly from low and middle income countries. And these are the same countries which also bear some of the highest pneumonia burdens. If I can have the next slide. In 2018, just five countries globally were responsible for more than half of child pneumonia deaths, with Nigeria and India leading the pack. Nigeria and India also have some of the highest number of estimated child pneumonia deaths attributable to household air pollution or HAP, despite some very steep declines in these attributable burdens over the last 20 years. Next slide. We now also have a sense of how do actions on household air pollution compared to other risk factors in reducing the pneumonia burden over the last 25 years, um, almost since the 1990s. And while globally, childhood wasting remains the leading cause, some of the largest gains in pneumonia deaths have come from reduced household air pollution, especially in the countries of India, Bangladesh, and Nepal. Next slide. In the last 10 years or so, perhaps even just the last five years or so, we have new and uh, important uh, you know, understanding which have um, strengthened uh, the weight of evidence for the exposure response relationships between household air pollution exposures and child pneumonia, especially from several clinical trials, including the one that Dr. Eric alluded to, uh, conducted across multiple countries that could serve to increase the momentum for clean household energy to reduce pneumonia burdens. Clearly, there would be gaps in what we know, but uh, what we would uh, like to propose is instead of trying to address and bridge all those gaps, I will try to phrase frame some near-term win-win paradigms that can perhaps help us sustain some of these clean energy actions. Before I uh, go on um, to, um, uh, into the details of the evidence uh, of exposure response from uh, HAP clinical trials, or household air pollution clinical trials, I thought it would be useful to make a few generalized observations for us to bear in mind as we put the application of the evidence in context. So if we could go to slide number six. First, household solid fuel combustion generates a complex cocktail of pollutants with very high intake fractions, uh, mainly because uh, the person who is receiving this dose is so close to the source of this incomplete combustion in virtually every configuration of use in low and middle income countries. It doesn't matter how solid fuels are used, but when they are used for everyday cooking, it is almost impossible to escape uh, you know, a very high uh, fraction of what is being emitted to be actually inhaled. 
But our attention in many of these clinical trials has been limited to only a couple of candidate uh, pollutants, carbon monoxide and particulate matter PM2.5, um, and only perhaps very recent to, uh, recently to black carbon. And our understanding of many of the other thousands of air toxics uh, is still uh, not very uh, good. And these air toxics have seldom been measured. Next slide. Second, exposures to ambient and household air pollution coexist in low and middle income countries. And we all recognize that both ambient and household air pollution are risk factors for pneumonia. And in many low and middle income countries, ambient air pollution is actually high because of the substantial contribution from the same household cook fuel sources that produce indoor exposures while cooking. Next slide. Third, we are now able to con conduct large scale and high resolution household air pollution exposure monitoring in rural households. You can see that from personal monitoring to microenvironmental monitoring to ambient monitoring in rural households. Next slide. We now can actually even put wearable devices on young children. And thanks to advances in instrumentation and the human resource capacities to conduct such monitoring, we have very nuanced understanding of of what ex, uh, exposures to young children, uh, you know, um, in their vulnerable age groups actually experience on a day-to-day uh, -day, uh, basis. Um, if we can go to slide number 10, shown here is a list of health outcomes that have been examined in household air pollution clinical trials, as well as observational studies to provide direct exposure response relationships. Fortunately for us, pneumonia has been included as a primary outcome in more than half a dozen trials and dozens of observational studies, and that now uh, we have the potential to inform and refine the estimates of household air pollution attributable pneumonia. Back um, um, uh, in, uh, in 2010, when the first um, GBD um, estimates were made for, uh, for um, HAP attributable pneumonia, we just had the RESPIRE trial for Guatemala informing the entire uh, you know, um, methodologies. But now in just the last uh, 15 years, we have more than um, dozens of studies that are providing exposure response relationships. So if I can go to slide number 11, uh, here uh, shown as I alluded to on the left are the results from the first ever exposure response relationship published for household air pollution, wherein a 50% exposure reduction of personal carbon monoxide concentrations for infants was significantly associated with much lower rates of physician diagnosed pneumonia among infants in Guatemala. On the right, on the same slide, are results from a more recent trial in Ghana, the GRAFS trial, where more than um, 1,000 infants, actually 1,200 infants, were followed up with more than 55,000 child weeks of field worker surveillance. Uh, the estimated risk for pneumonia and severe pneumonia in the first year of life increased by 10% and 15% respectively per one ppm increase in average prenatal carbon monoxide exposure and by 6% per one ppm increase in average postnatal carbon monoxide exposure. Taking a, a step further in the next slide are results from a hierarchical model for estimating long-term exposure exposure concentrations and estimating a common exposure response curve combining multiple uh, studies in Nepal, again showing uh, you know, a positive association with, uh, with uh, both uh, carbon monoxide and PM2.5 uh, exposures uh, for uh, childhood pneumonia. Um, and uh, if you can go to the next slide, while uh, it is important um, to uh, uh, remember uh, that uh, household air pollution impacts on child pneumonia uh, could be mediated both via direct and indirect pathways, and the most important indirect impacts could be via the ha household air pollution impacts on birth weight, and evidence for that too has been accumulating. 
The Graf's household ablution trial in Ghana reports a 38 gram decrease per one ppm change in carbon monoxide exposures during uh, pregnancy. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, most uh, recently, if I can have the next slide, results from exposure response analysis in the HAPIN trial, which was conducted across four countries involving uh, 3,200 uh, pregnant women and uh, infants under one um, uh, in the countries of Guatemala, Rwanda, Peru, and India, uh, we estimate that an interquartile increase in average prenatal exposure to particulate matter and black carbon to be associated, uh, significantly associated with the reduction in birth weight as well as reduced weight for gestational age Z scores. The HAPIN trial achieved near complete adherence to an LPG intervention and consequently the median post-intervention exposures remained consistently below the WHO interim target guideline of 35 micrograms per meter cube, demonstrating the potential for clean cook fuels to achieve health relevant exposure reductions that can have significant implications for childhood pneumonia uh, burdens in these settings. So uh, if I can go to the next slide, uh, slide 15. So what do we make of all of this evidence? You know, uh, very high resolution, high, uh, you know, uh, high quality studies, uh, especially in the light of uh, technology-based WHO air quality guidelines for household air pollution published nearly eight years ago. Uh, you know, do we uh, need more evidence from uh, such clinical trials to already push the momentum for clean fuel interventions? Uh, and I just have uh, a few suggestions uh, for us to con uh, consider, uh, you know, um, uh, as we uh, come to uh, uh, the, uh, the conclusion of uh, this uh, particular uh, session. On slide 16, um, I want to show some results uh, from India where we have demonstrated that mitigating just this one source of ambient uh, particulate matter uh, 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 household cook fuels could put us below the WHO air quality guideline in nearly all of the country. And we have to be very mindful that household solid cook fuels are the single largest contributor to ambient PM 2.5 concentrations in many, many uh, highly populated low and middle income countries. And mitigating these sources with clean fuels such as LPG could be the lowest hanging fruit for co-benefits for improvements in both ambient and household air pollution exposures with consequent uh, you know, benefits for childhood pneumonia. Slide 17, and we keep focusing on exposure response for specific child or maternal health and outcomes in this particular case, child pneumonia. But I wonder if uh, we should now uh, turn our um, attention to doing an exposure response for health inequities. We um, uh, we talked about we talk about many health uh, inequities that can have huge implications for pneumonia, health systems, you know, mothers' uh, time poverty, and exacerbating inequities in health and clean energy access has to occupy a bigger consideration than what we are according. It is not you know, enough if we sort of maintain pneumonia surveillance and we sort of pneumo uh, maintain uh, household air pollution exposure surveillance. It is important to sort of really look at what is changing holistically in these communities. And uh, in conclusion, I would like to say in the last slide that while we need to strengthen the evidence, there is nothing in the pool of evidence that argues against clean energy interventions. These are improved stuff interventions, these are clean fuel interventions, and these are renewable energy interventions, these are fossil fuel based clean energy interventions, but HAP mitigation via clean energy transitions is perhaps the best possible way for low and middle income countries to be on the trajectory for eliminating air pollution attributable burdens from pneumonia and beyond. So with this, I would like to uh, make a, a, you know, a very strong plea for according 
air pollution as, um, uh, as an important risk factor for pneumonia that can really make a huge difference uh, for LMICs in this factor being eliminated as um, a risk factor, even as we focus attention on many of the other classical uh, pneumonia risk factors for, child, uh, for children in low and middle income countries. Thank you again very much for your kind attention.